You know, uh, earlier when Sister Erica was singing the song Waymaker, I was just thinking in my heart, if God hadn't made a way, none of us would be here this morning. Amen. So thank God for making a way because we couldn't have made it to this place on our own. It was God who had to go before us to make a way for us to be here this morning. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you very much. May God bless you this wonderful morning. I believe it is the first weekend of fall, so we all know what's coming after this. Amen. Um, I'm not going to be taking a lot of time today, but uh, I would just like to give you a very quick update on the work of the Lord uh, in India, uh, specifically the school, because uh, again, as always, I'm so thankful for the support that Faith Sanctuary sends regularly every single month for the work of the Lord, specifically the school back um, in Rajamundry, India. So this year, you know, our academic year starts a little bit different from Canada. Uh, this year we have 265 uh, students in the school from pre-kindergarten all the way to grade 10. And um, the, the, the way that you measure success in any school in India is by the percentage of students passing out with distinction. Uh, you know, first class, second class, they don't count, but how many people got over 80% is that what, that's what counts. And uh, schools that are run commercially, uh, you would see them having advertisements in major leading newspapers front page saying we have 99% pass rate over distinction. But our school is very small. Amen. But every single day we pray and we say, God, we, we don't have the, the, the capacity or we don't have the finances to hire teachers that are top notch and, you know, uh, and all of those things. So we need your help. Because in the book of Proverbs, Solomon wrote this. He said, ask God for wisdom. And, and by wisdom and knowledge and understanding, God made this whole world. So, um, you know, long story short, we have a 98% pass mark. You know, amen, praise the Lord. You know, you always get one or two of the lazy ones because of which the percentage drops. But uh, 98 is, is not bad, amen. So I'm so thankful and, and I'm so grateful. A lot of people uh, ask me, so do you keep track of all these kids after they have left the school? Yes, we do. And, um, you know, some of them have, um, are studying to be uh, doctors. Uh, a couple of them are in their first and second year of engineering. And, and a lot of other people have gone into various trades. And the reason why we keep track of them is not to feel good as to, you know, oh, our kids who came from this school have done so much. It is to tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, it's time for you to pay back to the school that gave you the, the, the tools that you have to go out and, you know, to get good uh, admission in good colleges. So we want them to put something back into the school that they came out of. Amen. So I'm so thankful that God has uh, blessed the school, and through that, he has blessed the church as well, because we have a lot of people coming into the house of God through the students who are studying in the school. Uh, I've mentioned this before. Every day in the morning and in the evening, we have prayer. We send the kids home with a word of prayer, and when they go home, the parents ask them, what did you learn in school today? And the first thing that comes to their mind is the last thing that they had heard before leaving for home. And they said, oh, we prayed before we, we walked out of the school building. So in that way, it is, a, it is a way to reach out to people who were otherwise who we wouldn't have been able to reach out. Amen. I bring you greetings from my parents who are in India and from the churches and the fellowship and from all the, all the staff and all the pastors who work at the church, at the school. And, um, and I just want to assure you of one thing, and I hope you will remember this. Every single day, prayer is made for this church and all the people that are in this church back in India. Amen. They pray for you every single day. There's no day that they miss. It is, it is, it is very, very, very regulated. And every single day, prayer for you, wonderful people, is made back in India by your brothers and sisters there. Amen. 
Amen. I am um, I'm so um, happy to have my family with me today and uh, my wife and kids. We have been married for almost 20 years. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, uh, Brother Desmond, in the beginning when we were married, we would say those cute little things to each other, like, you know, uh, I love you and so on. But now 20 years later, those I love yous have changed to I told you so. <laughs> Amen. But it's all good, all good. Amen. Thank, thank the Lord for, for, uh, for a wonderful wife. Um, and I'm so grateful to the Lord uh, that he has given her to me as an help. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, I, I, I know I have limited time today, and um, I would like to greet all the visitors, guests over here who came in for the blessing of the children, uh, guests who are watching online. We are so thankful and grateful that you are here. Uh, I don't want to stretch out this time too much, and I'm going to go directly into the word of the Lord this morning. So if you could be so kind as to stand today for the reading of the word, I have two portions of scripture that I would like to read from. Book of Hebrews chapter number 11 and two verses from the book of Hebrews. I'm going to go ahead and read from the King James Version. Book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 15 and 16. Verse 15 says, and truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is an heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. One more scripture from the book of Hebrews again, if you would go back a chapter. Chapter number 10, book of Hebrews, verse number 38 and 39. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. We are not of them who draw back. Amen. May God bless you. You may have a seat. Amen. You know, um, nostalgia is a very strange thing. When I was looking up the word nostalgia, it says that remembering the past with happiness and sadness. So you have two emotions. You know, you remember the past and you say, oh, I wish, you know, good old days. And, uh, you know, anyone here think about the good old days? Amen? Well, I don't because uh, we didn't have microwaves growing up. In fact, I remember my grandmother cooking food on a, on a, uh, you know, on a wooden stove with coals. And um, so barbecue was not that interesting to me after coming here. Because all through our young age, we tasted barbecue smoke flavored food. But, uh, you know, so many things have advanced in our life. But sometimes we still look back to the good old days, to the good old times, and, and we reflect on them with happiness and, and with sadness. Uh, my grandparents, they escaped from the country of Burma. You, if you look at me, I, I'm not Burmese. I don't look Burmese. I, I, I look Indian. Uh, but they were living in the country of Burma. They were taken, their forefathers were taken from India as, as uh, slaves to work in the sugarcane fields of Burma, rice fields and sugarcane. So they grew up there. Well, 1942, uh, during the Second World War, uh, the British forces and the Japanese forces, they clashed over the country of Burma. Japan was advancing this way. Britain was trying to push them back. And the fight was over the country of Burma. And they said, OK, all people, they just need to, civilians need to leave the country. So my grandfather, uh, with just the clothes on his back and a little, little bag, he had to leave everything behind, got on a ship. He sent my grandmother on a refugee ship. They both came to refugee camps in India. And they started their life uh, all over again uh, in, the, in, the, in the country of India. They were Indians, but they were foreigners in their own country uh, because they had no relation. They had nothing. They had to start from scratch. But God blessed them, amen? And, and uh, my grandfather, uh, my grandmother, 
during when our, our childhood, we would ask her sometimes, say, Grandma, tell us stories about your life back in Burma. What kind of life was it? What kind of house did you guys live in? What kind of work did you guys do? And believe me, she had an endless supply of stories about how Burma and how they used to live there. But my grandfather, he was a man of small words except when he was preaching. So uh, when we, we would ask him, oh, Grandpa, what do you remember about your, your past, your, your country that you left behind? And um, he would just look at us and say, there's no use talking about it. It's all in the past. Let's look to the future. Let's look to what God has in store for us in the future. No need to think about the past. Amen. Hallelujah. His name was Reverend A. N. Jonah. Now, I know what the A stands for. It's the last name. But I, I, I'm, I'm telling you this truthfully. Until I was in my late 20s, I never knew what the N standard uh, stood for. I would always wonder why everybody would just say A. N. Jonah, and nobody would tell us what the middle name, what the N stand, stood for. So uh, in India, we have a custom, brothers and sisters. See, uh, uh, Indian people, they have, um, I believe it is 33 million gods and goddesses that they worship. So uh, when a child is born, and just like we had the baby, babies being blessed today, children being blessed today, so when the child is born, the parents of a, of a you know, religious Hindu family they name their children based on one of the gods and the goddesses and, and all of that sort. And so, uh, but when these people grow up, they've, they've grown their whole life, you know, called by a name of a Hindu god. But when uh, they come into the house of God, when we talk to them, they, they give their life to Jesus and, you know, uh, they, they read the word and then they are baptized. When they take baptism in the name of Jesus, we always give them a new name. We don't want to call them by their old name anymore. We don't want that name, the old name, to impact them anymore. And also, it serves as a testimony because now when they are baptized and they go out into the world, the, the people ask them, hey, what is your name? Oh, my name is David. Oh, so, so you're Christian. Yes, sir, I am Christian. Were you born Christian? No, but I just got baptized last week, and this is my new name. Oh, my name is Samuel. Really? Your name is Samuel. Are you a Christian? Yes, I am a Christian. That gives them an opportunity to say to the world, hey, you know what? I'm not that person anymore. I am Samuel. I am David. I am Solomon, right? And I am Jonah. So that's how his whole life went by. So one time, um, uh, and, and they, never, they never say what their old name is anymore. Uh, in, in, in the ministry circle in India, we call that a hard reset. You know, you just reset the phone, the laptop, whatever, bring it down to factory settings, and then you start it all over again. So now I have a new name. It, it, was, it was his name, Jonah. And that's what all the people knew him by. But his old name, the, the middle name, N, was called Narayana Swami, which is a name of a Hindu god. And, and he omitted that name, and he kept the name Jonah. Amen. The same goes for my wife's grandfather, whose name was K.R. David. Not a lot of people know what the K or the R stood for, but they knew him as Pastor David. So, so this is how the, the, the thing uh, works in India, a hard reset. Amen. But um, this verse from the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11, that we had read in the beginning, it says, if we had known where we came out of, we might have had an opportunity to go back, amen? But we don't have the option anymore because we don't know where we came out of. Everything is new. God changed everything, and now I don't need to go back to where I came out of, amen? Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, in, um, uh, I'm not a computer person at all by, by a long shot, but I do know one thing, that if my laptop hangs up, there is a force quit button. You press two, three buttons, and the computer shuts down. It's called a force quit. In the earlier, um, I don't know how many people would remember this, in the, in the early days of the computer, uh, when computers started to become personal, there were keyboards that came with a quit option. 
and you would just press it and everything would just quit. Now they have the escape option, they have the force quit and all of that. But, but earlier computers had the quit option. And even today you can click on a window and hit quick, you can force quit. But as people of God, brothers and sisters, I just want to tell you this one thing this morning. After you leave here, you know, you might not remember much of what I've said, but I would like you to remember this one thing, that as people of God, we have no quit option. We don't have a quit option built within us. There is no quit option. We've come way too far to turn back and go now. We've come way too close to the finish line to look back and say, you know what, I'm tired, I'll do this again tomorrow. We have come way too close to, to, to almost, we're almost touching the streets of gold, amen. There is no quit option today. There is no quit option today. And as you walk out of these doors, if you just make up your mind, I'm not quitting. Amen? I am not quitting. Whatever storms may come, I will hold on. Whatever life may, you know, throw at me. They say life, when life throws at lemons at you, do what? Make lemonade. Amen? So do it. And, but whatever happens, I'm not going to quit. There is no quit option in me. I have got too much invested in my life through God and through God's people for me to give up now and quit now. Amen? Hallelujah. The people of God, if we read in the book of Numbers, uh, people of God were redeemed from the land of Egypt. They, they cried out to God. They were under slavery, bondage, pain, and hunger. And God redeemed them from the land of Egypt and with many miracles. And, uh, you know, we know the story. Amen. But very short, shortly after leaving the land of Egypt, they began to look back. Numbers chapter 11 and verse 5 and 6, you may read it later. It says they looked back and they remembered the fish that they had eaten in Egypt. And um, they had watermelons, the Bible says, onions, cucumbers, and the garlic of Egypt. So these were the things that they were looking back to. Amen. At the time, while they were being fed with manna. Amen. Could you imagine this? You are being fed miraculously every single morning with food of the angels that comes down from heaven. And while you're eating that, you think about the fish and the melons and the garlic. Amen. And then look at what the people had to say. You know, this is, this is what blew me away. Uh, Numbers 11, 5 and 6. And they said, but now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna. Amen. Hallelujah. They were ready to quit. They even elected leaders to take them back. They said, okay, you know what? We are going to elect people who will take us back into the land of Egypt. And as a consequence, the Bible tells us, how many made it to the promised land? Only two. Praise the Lord. You know why? Because these people had the quit option built in them. Oh, it's too hard. I, I can't do it anymore. I I'm ready to go back. I'm ready to go back. I'm ready to go back. To where I, where I came from. Amen. But brothers and sisters, this morning, God's word tells us we have no quit option within us. There is no quit option built within us. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. When Elijah found Elisha at the field and threw his mantle over him, he just said, follow me. And Elisha said, okay, you know what? Before I leave, I'm going to do one thing. I'm going to slaughter the oxen. I'm going to break the farming implements. Everything that tied me to, to attracted me to come back here, I'm going to burn it up. I'm going to sacrifice it. So that in my journey with the man of God, if there is ever a time that I think, oh, let me go back to farming, there is nothing to go back to. Because I've burnt all the bridges while I was coming here. There is nothing to go back to. I've burned the oxen. I've burned the farming implements. What am I going to do after I reach back there? So there is no quit option to the man of God. Amen. Moving on in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. This surprised me because right in the middle, you know, we call the, the book of Hebrews chapter number 11 as uh, the warriors of faith. They are listed there. But right in the middle of writing about uh, Abraham and Sarah, the writer makes this comment and he said, if they knew where they had come from, they might have had opportunity to go back. Amen. So God removed, you know, if you read it in, in, in the, as a whole, from all those people who are listed there, 
they had no quit option in them. The only way to go was forward. At the, at the Red Sea, where, when the army of the Pharaoh was behind and the sea was in front, the book of Numbers tells us that Moses went to God and he said, God, what do we do now? We have the army of the Pharaoh behind us and the sea in front of us. And God said, why do you ask me, Moses? Just tell the people to go forward. There is no going back. There is no going back. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, in my walk with God, I have seen many people in my family quit and go back. Quit and turn back. And uh, it seems like it's happening way too often than, than we realize. Amen. But, um, and I've thought about it, I said, you know, why do people quit and go back? Because that is the easy option. It's very easy. It's very easy to say, no, I can't do it anymore. Oh, it's very easy to say, uh, this, is, this is the last thing I'm going to be facing. I, I cannot do this anymore. But remember this one thing, brothers and sisters. The problem with quitting is that very, very soon it becomes a habit. You quit once. You feel bad about it. You quit twice, not so bad. And then again, very soon you realize it becomes, it becomes a habit. And I'd like to talk to young people this, uh, this morning and just tell them this. I don't know what you're facing, and I don't know what kind of situation you're in. But I, and I don't know why God put this word in my heart this morning, but I just want to tell you, don't quit. Hang in there. There is, remove that quit option from your life. When it comes to God and when it comes to his work, when it comes to the church, there is no quit option in us. Amen. Hallelujah. The Apostle Paul, who is a great example, who has written so many books of the New Testament, reminds us of his experiences in the book of Acts chapter number 20. And uh, from verse number 18, and I'm just going to read a, a couple of uh, passages over here. He said, and when they were come to him, he said unto them, and this is Paul speaking. He said, ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations. Now hear this out. Which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. But I have shown you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, now, behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and affliction abide me. Basically, what he's saying in a small sentence is, Everywhere I went, every city I went to, there were Jews lying in wait for me. He knew it. Yeah, man, no surprise. He said, I know they'll be waiting for me. I know they will be there to harm me. And everywhere where I went, the Holy Ghost told me that every city that I go to, there will be bonds and there will be afflictions that I would have to face. But hear me out on this verse, now verse number 24. He said, but none of these things move me. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, I, I, I need myself, I'm talking about myself today. I need to come to a place in God where I can say, none of these things move me. Hallelujah. None of these things move me. Hey, people will talk behind your back. They will talk in front of you. That's okay. They don't move me. Maybe people will be lying in wait for me. Hallelujah. Every place I go, I may have to suffer for the name of Jesus, but hey, none of these things move me. Amen. I'm just going to go ahead. He said, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, I pray this morning, let your testimony and my testimony be this. None of these things move me. But wherever I go, I will testify of the gospel of the grace of Jesus. I will testify that the Lord Jesus made a way for me to be here. I will testify that God brought me to this place, hallelujah, to worship him. Praise God. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. 
uh, to 28. He says, you know, I'm not going to read all of this, but he says, in everything, in perils, in nakedness, in affliction, in suffering, in perils among false brethren, weariness, painfulness, hunger, thirst, in all of these things, Paul said, in the end he said, besides those things that are without, which cometh upon me daily, the care of all of these churches. You know, when reading this passage, you would think, at some point, this man Paul would have said, hey, enough is enough. I I've taken on too much. I've suffered too much. I've been beaten 39 stripes on my back twice. I've been stoned once. I was in shipwreck twice. Hallelujah. You know, I grew up in a military family, so to say. Both my parents worked for the Indian military. Uh, the, the problem with growing up in a military family is that, and when both your parents are in the military, is that uh, they forget when is house and when is work. So, so the, the office rolled over into our house. And so we were treated as, as military cadets at home. And, um, you know, people would often ask us, uh, who are you most scared of, your mom or your dad? And we would say, hey, we are scared to even say that. You know, we are we even scared to choose which one. We couldn't figure out who was more scarier. So we grew up in that house, and, and I remember this. Uh, uh, and of course, because of uh, them being in the military, my sister and I, we, we studied you know, all the way from kindergarten to grade 12 in military schools. And, um, and those uh, schools, sometimes they would expose us to how the soldiers were being trained. And uh, because they wanted to, you know, encourage young people to join the military. So they would, um, uh, it did the opposite for me. I was like running away. I said, no, no, I, I can't do this. So they were, they were, they were, they would take us there with the drill sergeants and all of them and the new people who had just been recruited. And one thing that I would, um, I would never forget this statement, and this is from way back. The drill sergeant telling the, the cadets, the, the soldiers in training, he would say, after they'd been through a whole day of whatever they were doing, he would say, remember this, I am kind towards you. The enemy will not be as kind. After they had done their whole days of exercises and they were hardly in a proper mental state of mind and, you know, water, sweat, blood, bruises, everything all over their body and they, they were waiting for the next thing, what he's going to say. He would say, remember this, I know where your limit is. Amen? But the enemy will not be as kind. So that's why we train you this way. And so, so uh, the, you know, at the same way, in the same way, the Apostle Paul tells us, he says, God knows our limit. God knows what we can take. Amen. And he knows where, what we can take. And he just wants to see how far we can go trusting him without quitting. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, um, you know, he said um, uh, in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 1 and verse number 12, he said, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Brothers and sisters, how do you remove the quit option from your life? You need to be persuaded that God is able. Amen. Once you have that persuasion in your heart, once it's set deep down in stone, God is able. He is able to do anything for me. He said it in his word. He said, is there anything impossible for me? Amen. Hallelujah. And once we have that within us, the quit option goes away. Hallelujah. I'm going to end in, in the next couple of minutes, but I, I cannot end without this one example. Our greatest example of never quitting and never turning back is from the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And verse number three, it says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. 
Hallelujah. Jesus endured the pain of the cross. The strings of the whip across his back. They spit on his face. They slapped his face with an open palm. They put a crown of thorns upon his head. And, and you know, at any single moment of time, he could have commanded 10,000 angels to come down and help him at any single moment. But he had already removed that quit option at the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, Father, not my will, but let your will be done. Hallelujah. And that's, when, when, that's why when they nailed him to the cross and, and he suffered for hours with thirst, with pain, with agony, at the end of everything, he said, it is finished. I have not gone back. I have done what you have sent me to do. It is finished. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, Hebrews encourages us, it says, when you are facing your battles, health-related battles, finance-related battles, battles related to family, whatever they may be, the Bible says, think about Jesus. Consider him. Consider him. Hallelujah. Whatever trials you are going through, whatever problems you are facing, whatever mountain stands before you, brothers and sisters, this morning I would encourage you not to quit. Amen. There is no turning back for us. There is a very famous song that I think we all know. It says, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And if you, I think I told about the history of this song before. It was a song, I think one of the, the very popular songs that came out of the country of India. It was from a state, northeastern state of India called Assam, when a man who was uh, the leader of, of a small village was being uh, tortured and persecuted for his faith in Jesus. He came up with these words. He said, I have decided to follow Jesus. Praise the Lord. There's no turning back. Could we all stand up this afternoon? Amen. Brothers and sisters, as guests, as you are leaving today, as you walk out of this sanctuary, I just want you to think about this one thing. I will not quit. I will not turn back. I have decided to follow Jesus. There is no turning back. There is no turning back. And as people were killing his family in front of him, this man who wrote this song, he penned the words. He said, the world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. And they said, hey, no one's going to come with you. you you'll, you'll be dead. You'll be the only Christian here, and we are going to kill you. And he wrote the words. He said, though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, I will still follow. Because in my heart, in the, in the deepest part of my heart, I have decided. I'm not turning back. I'm not turning back. I'm not quitting. I don't have that quit option within me anymore because I don't know where I came from. And, 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 and that option is gone. I only have one way to go, which is forward. May God bless you this afternoon, brothers and sisters. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Praise.